Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Christian worship and preaching have as their objective a couple of things. One, of course, is the adoration and the praise of God. That's why ultimately we are here, to adore Him, to praise Him. Y'all, excuse me, just one moment. We have a dead battery. Have to use this one. Uh, it was green this morning. I apologize. Uh, y'all ever have dead batteries? <laughs> Anybody? Y'all, uh, okay, I have your full sympathy. Now that I have your sympathy, we can go on with this thing, and I'll try to stay turned this way so that you can hear me. Christian worship and preaching. We are here to praise Him. We are here to adore Him. We are to offer to Him the sacrifice of our praise and of our thanksgiving. It... it our worship actually serves a dual purpose. First and foremost, we are confronted by the truth of the gospel. The truth is that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him, period. End of discussion. Jesus is the object of our adoration. We are confronted with the gospel claim that Jesus is the way. We are confronted with the gospel claim that we are to live our lives in Christ in a certain way. There are expectations. There are some things that uh, people tend to think of the Christian faith as one of negativity. It's, it's what we can't do. I want to tell you this morning, it's not what we can't do that's important. It's what we can do through Jesus Christ our Lord that we need to be focused upon this morning. We are confronted with the gospel claim, but we're also comforted this morning with the gospel's promise. If you read through the Bible, and some of you have made a habit of doing this, and you've read all the names that are given to God. Many of you have read and studied all of the names that are given to Christ. And in our Scripture passage this morning, we're going to look at a couple of those references about who God is. Uh, if you would look with me at verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Let's pray. Father, this morning we have come into your presence thankful for who you are. Rejoicing in the blessings that we have experienced in this life. Knowing that this life is not perfect. Knowing that this world is not perfect. But we know who you are today. And we're thankful for that. And at this moment, it is my prayer that we would seek the counsel of your word. That we would covet the presence of Your Spirit in this place. That our joy might be fulfilled in Jesus Christ our Lord. In whose name we pray. Many names are ascribed to God. And one of those we see this morning is the Father of mercies. Now I don't know about you this morning, but I am so thankful that we can turn to God and we know that He is merciful. Were it not for the mercies of God, I can truthfully say that I would not be standing here today. Were it not for the mercies of God, I can truthfully say that we would all be consumed. But we are in the care and in the keeping of a merciful God and we thank Him for that today. But there is one that I want to share with you that is dearer to me than all of the rest. I know that Jesus is God. I understand that. But this is the one that captures my heart. This is the one that, that speaks to my heart, that draws me into Him because the Bible very distinctly says that He is the God 
of all comfort. Let this be God's word to you this morning. He is the God of all comfort. Anybody in here ever had your heart broken? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about those things that just come out of the blue. They're totally unexpected. It could be a, a sudden grief. It could be a long-term grief. It could be health problems that just so consume you that, uh, that you're just overwhelmed. It could be drawn out suffering. It could be broken promises. You go down the list. You name those things and you understand what it means to have your heart broken to have your dreams absolutely shattered your plans altered your life turned upside down we understand broken heartedness in this world we've all experienced it now I want to say to you this morning if you are not very careful you can allow yourself to wallow in if you're not very careful, you can get consumed by that. And you will begin to think that this is what normal looks like. This grief, this, this sorrow, this suffering. And you begin to think that this is all in the world that I have left to look forward to you. There is hope. And His name is Jesus. There is comfort. He is the God of all comforts this morning. We need to take heart. We need to be of good courage. We need to lift up our eyes to the glory of the Lord and understand that He has not left us comfortless. That was Jesus' last promise. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You will be comforted. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Rather than focus on the grief and the sorrow of this world and the, and the broken hearts and the broken promises, let's this morning focus in faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And let us in faith focus on God in us. God with us. The God of all comfort. I want you to think for a moment about the nature of the comfort that we have. Uh, Y'all seen the people that act like nothing bad ever happens in their lives? Anybody? Y'all ever heard that... Uh, that old saying, ignorance is bliss. And you think there's a lot of happy people running around here. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, listen, to be comforted in the midst of sorrow, to be comforted in a time of grief and heartbreak is not to deny reality. A lot of people like to do that. Oh, this, is, this just can't be real. This is not happening to me. But yet it is. <laughs> it is. And you need comfort in the midst of it. When the bad things happen in this life, and if they haven't happened to you yet, give it a few minutes. Some of the bad things will come along. Our natural reaction when those things happen, oh, this just can't be. Long-term denial does not contribute to your healing process. Long-term denial will not make the problems and the realities go away. Yes, we know life must go on. Uh, we pick up the pieces, as shattered as they may be, and we go on. We pick up the pieces of what is left of our lives and we put them back together, not in our own strength and our own power. We put those pieces back together under the tutelage and the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. We can't run away from grief. It will catch you. And you may experience a broken heart yet again. But I'm so thankful this morning that one of His names is the God of all comfort. Some people think about this word comfort and they think, boy, preacher, that's just kind of weak. We... Uh, we want to, uh, we need something more. We need something substantial, something to hold us together when the horrible times come. I want to say to you this morning that that, that word, that same Greek root word uh, for comfort, finds its place in the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, you 
Don't need the Greek word. But it is to be called alongside, to be brave, uh, to be courageous. God gives you courage when you had none. God gives you strength where you had none. God gives you bravery in the midst of heartache, grief, and despair. That's the nature of our comfort. It's not denying reality. Matter of fact, it is embracing reality with God's help. It is grabbing hold of reality and recognizing that we don't have to face reality by ourselves. We have the promise of His Holy Spirit. We have the promise of someone that is there to lift us up. How many of you have ever had a really good friend that's gone through a difficult time and you were there for them? Anybody? You went there. You, 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 were, you didn't have to say a word, but you were there. You didn't have to do anything. You were there. Maybe it was just a hug. Listen, sometimes there are no right words to say. Uh, when, when you go through and experience the death of a loved one, the preacher doesn't have magic words. That still remains. But you know what? It feels so good when someone is there just to put their arms around you and tell you that they love you. Just to know that they, you're not going through that alone. And if you've done that for a friend, or if a friend has done that for you, then you have a small token of what the Holy Spirit has promised to do for us every day. That comfort, that, that being there, that, that surrounding presence of God with us. The source of our comfort this morning it, listen, it's not in trying to escape. I read, uh, I read a thing about an Irishman, and, and if there's anybody here that's Irish, I want to go ahead and offer you my apologies right now. Uh, I can't speak Irish very well, and if I did speak Irish, it would be with a southern accent, and I don't know if there are southerners in Ireland. I guess there's a southern part of that. But an Irishman was asked uh, one time, why do you drink? And he said, well, I drink to escape my problems. I know that was bad Irish. I, <laughs> I, I, I drink to drown my troubles. The friend says, well, does it work? And he said, nay, the devils can swim. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it's not in trying to escape the problems. They're going to come. Anybody in here trouble free? Anybody? I don't think so. At least I know I'm in the right place. There's no comfort in brave philosophy. Listen to me just a moment. You can tell somebody just holds your chin up. You know, sometimes it does work. Sometimes your chin's going to fall. We can tell people every cloud has a silver lining. Well, yeah, that's good when your heart's breaking. You know, that, that, that doesn't do you a lot of good at that moment. Or you may have been told real men don't cry. If that is the case, I submit to you this morning that I am not a real man. If that is the case. Every real man I've ever known cried. Attitude that we have may seem brave, but there's no gospel. That, that being strong and putting on a, a, a big brave front, that, that may impress other people. But the hurt's still there. The heartbreak is still wrapped up all over you. And there is no gospel help in a brave attitude. Friends help. I thank God for friends. Listen to me carefully. There is no everlasting help, even from a friend. We need divine comfort. 
We need divine comfort underneath His everlasting arms. That's where the comfort comes from. He is the God of all comfort. If you would, look with me to verse 4 of chapter 1. There we'll look at that verse. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Think about the scope of, of our comfort that is offered from God. It's not just part of our lives. It's all of our afflictions. It's all of our tribulations. Uh, you notice that He comforts us in all our tribulation. If you are His child, you cannot escape that. That's the promise of God to the people of God that He will be there to comfort your heart. During times of distress, during times of trial, during tribulation. Uh, you remember the, uh, the story about the Apostle Paul and his thorn in the flesh. And, and rather than a theological debate about what that thorn might have been, Paul had problems. And he could not fix that problem himself. And that problem, even though he prayed three times that it be removed, the problem remained. It was not taken away. What he found was that God's grace was sufficient for him in all things. Uh, I believe the words were, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And he could have said, Paul, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul's human being, just like us. Was he close to God? Absolutely. Did he have more pull with God than you do? No. He prayed to the same God at the same throne of grace that you and I do. Was he mightily used of God? Absolutely. Can you be mightily used of God? Absolutely. Paul prayed it didn't go away. He found that God's grace was sufficient. We are comforted in anxiety. We are comforted in mental anguish. If you would, look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. This is a very important verse. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. This is tied to uh, the admonition that we rejoice always. This is tied to the verse that we are to be anxious for nothing, but we are to approach everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, and therefore we make our request known to God. Then in verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, the God of all comfort. I would say to you this morning, I was a guilty sinner. And God reached out to me. I was a guilty sinner. And there is comfort to be found in the forgiveness of guilt. See, I know in a, in a congregation this size that some of you this morning are beating yourselves over the head with a guilt hammer. Something that the devil keeps reminding you of. And over and over and over again you go back to that place and, you, and, and, and the guilt just tears you up and, and you begin to just lose sight of the day because the guilt of yesterday is, is bearing down and the weight's overwhelming. There's joy to know that your sins are forgiven. There's joy to know that the guilt can be taken away. And there's joy to know that absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither height nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities. Nothing in this world and nothing out of this world can separate us 
from the love of God. We can find comfort. We can find comfort even in the face of death itself. Because He, Jesus, experienced death. And He showed us what it was like to overcome death. Hey folks, that's the victory. That is, we ought to rejoice. There ought to be a smile on your face this morning from ear to ear just knowing that your sins have been forgiven. He is the God of all comfort. Jesus conquered death for us. But also in that passage of Scripture that we read, in 2 Corinthians, we find that uh, in verse 4, there is a stewardship of the comfort that we are offered. And this morning, that stewardship of comfort is just overwhelming for me because I understand that He has overcome it all. And I understand that when He comforts me, whatever I'm going through, I'm to use that comfort to comfort someone else who is going through a similar circumstance. I want to be honest with you this morning, and I want to tell you exactly like it is. I used to think that I was a good pastor, and I used to think that I was a good counselor, but may I say to you in all honesty that I could not really, really empathize with parents whose children were going through a divorce until it was my child that went through that divorce. Until God comforted me through that procedure. And then I could say to those parents as they sat across the desk from me, I know what you're going through. I've experienced that. But here is the hope. Here is the comfort. And it didn't come from me. It came from Him. And He comforted me. And now I'm going to pass that along to you. There is the stewardship of the comfort that we have been given. We are able to comfort others in ways that we simply cannot by ourselves. And when you comfort someone else, please remember the words of our Savior. And I believe it counts for this particular thing as well, inasmuch as you have done it for the least of these. You've done it for me. Many of you this morning, you're not strangers to suffering. Some of you I know have gone through more than others. Yes, you've suffered. But you've also found comfort. Because you know where that comfort came from. And now you may be able to comfort someone else in ways that you never could have before. You understand what that heartbreak feels like. You understand what that suffering feels like. I'd like to end this morning by saying that Jesus suffered on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. He paid the price for our sins so that we wouldn't have to. He sacrificed Himself so that we wouldn't have to. He suffers with us in intercession. You are not alone. He is the God of all comfort. Let's pray. Father, right now.